In simple words, the domain of a function is the list or set of all x values that you are allowed to plug into a function f of x, such that it won't break any math rules. For example, if you have a function square root of x, you cannot put in a negative number. Why? Because in real number math, the square root of a negative number does not exist. So, every time you are given a function, the first thing you ask is, what values of x can I use without causing problems? That's what domain questions are all about. In almost all of the domain problems, you only need to check the following six constraints every single time, which will help you solve any domain question confidently and correctly. First, any time a variable is in the denominator, you must make sure that it never becomes zero because division by zero is undefined. Let's take a function like f of x equals 1 divided by x minus 3. Here, x minus 3 is in the denominator, so we must avoid x equals 3. Hence, the domain is all real numbers except 3. We write it like this from negative infinity to 3, union 3 to positive infinity. Note this curved bracket means the number next to it is not included in the domain, and a square bracket means the number next to it is included in the domain. So here, both these curved brackets means we are not including 3. Also, there is always a curved bracket beside infinity, because infinity is not an actual number and cannot be included in the domain. The next constraint applies when you see a square root, or any even-numbered root, like the fourth root or sixth root, and so on. You must make sure the number inside the square root, which we call the radicand, is greater than or equal to zero. Let's say we have a function. f of x equals the square root of x plus 5. This means x plus 5 must be greater than or equal to 0. Subtract 5 from both sides, and we get x is greater than or equal to minus 5. So the domain is from minus 5 to positive infinity. Now notice that we have used square brackets here in order to include minus 5. Next is the logarithm rule. If a function contains a logarithm, like log of something, then the input of the log must be strictly greater than zero. This is because the log of zero or a negative number does not exist in real numbers. For example, take the function f of x equals log of x minus two. We want to ensure that x minus two is greater than zero because the input of a logarithm must always be positive. Adding two to both sides, we get x is greater than two. So the domain is from 2 to positive infinity. Next up, we have trigonometric functions, which include sine, cos, and tan. Sine of x is defined for all values, so we have no problem here. Then the cos of x is also defined for all real values of x. Now tan of x is equal to sine of x divided by cos of x, and division by 0 is not allowed. So the tan of x is undefined whenever the cos of x is zero, and that happens at x equals pi divided by two, which is 90 degrees, or three pi divided by two, which is 270 degrees, and so on. In fact, it happens for every odd multiple of pi divided by two or two n plus one times pi over two. The rest of the trigonometric functions like cotangent, secant, and cosecant are just the reciprocals of tangent, sine, and cosine respectively, and can be handled accordingly. Next up, we have inverse trig functions. These are things like inverse of sine, cos, and tan functions. They take in a value and give you an angle. For example, the sine inverse of one-half gives you the angle whose sine value is one-half, which is 30 degrees, or pi divided by six. Now, sine inverse of x and cos inverse of x are only defined for values between minus one and one, both inclusive. This is because, look at their graphs, the sine and cos of any real angle can only give outputs between minus one and one, so their inverses can only take inputs within that same range. 
like saying the sine of any angle equals 3, would be nonsensical. But remember, the inverse of tan of x is defined for all real numbers. So if a function is f of x equals sine inverse of x plus 2, then x plus 2 must lie between minus 1 and 1. First, x plus 2 is greater than or equal to minus 1, and second, x plus 2 is less than or equal to 1. Solving the first gives x is greater than or equal to minus 3, and solving the second gives x is less than or equal to 1 minus 2 or minus 1. Now imagine placing both conditions on the number line. The first condition, x is greater than or equal to minus 3, means we shade everything starting from minus 3 and going to the right. The second condition, x is less than or equal to minus 1, means we shade everything from minus 1 going to the left. The part where both shaded regions overlap is from minus 3 to minus 1. So the domain is from minus 3 to minus 1, including both ends. Finally, this is not a constraint, but just something to be careful about. Sometimes you get functions inside other functions, called composite functions. For example, take the function f of x equals square root of log of x. Now you must obey both the log rule and the square root rule, because one function is nested inside another. The log of x must be greater than zero. This means that x must be greater than one because the log of one is zero, and log values become positive only when the input is greater than one. So the domain is x from one to infinity. Let's now go through a list of practice problems. The function is square root of x plus five. The expression inside the square root, which is x plus five, must be greater than or equal to zero. Solving this, we get x greater than or equal to minus 5. So, the domain is from minus 5 to infinity, including minus 5. Let's take the function log of x squared minus 1 and find its domain. According to the log rule, the input to the logarithm must always be greater than 0. So we take the expression inside the log, which is x squared minus 1, and make sure it is greater than zero. Now, x squared becomes greater than one when x is either less than minus one or greater than one. Therefore, the domain is from negative infinity to minus one and from one to positive infinity. See, that was super duper easy. Let me know in the comments what will be the domain of this function. Next, let us look at the function log of the square root of x minus 1 divided by x squared minus 4. To make this problem easier, we can simply use the log rule where log of a over b is same as log a minus log b. So, this thing will be the same as the log of square root of x minus 1 minus log of x squared minus 4. Now we can simplify it further by writing this square root of x minus 1 as x minus 1 raised to half. Now we use the log rule which says the log of a raised to b is the same as b times log of a. So this becomes half times log of x minus 1. Now we know that the expression inside the log must be greater than 0. So x minus 1 must be greater than 0. That gives us x greater than 1. Keep it aside for a while. Now look at this part x squared minus 4 must be greater than 0, which happens when x is greater than 2 or less than minus 2. Now, on the real number line, this region is x greater than 1. Then, this is x less than 2 or x greater than 2 on the same line. So, their intersection is simply x greater than 2 or simply from 2 to infinity, and that's it. This way, we can solve any domain problem with 100% confidence. So good!